Hi, welcome to WesleyGospel.com. Today I'm going to talk about spiritual but not religious. This, uh, this is a self-described uh, expression that's been around for about 30 years. Uh, so apparently people started using this expression back in the 90s. Um, and this... Uh, self-descripting uh, moniker, spiritual but not religious, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious, um, is is at a height right now uh, among the millennials and others. So I'm going to try to describe this the best I can, and then we're going to ask ourselves, is it biblical to think like this? But first off, you know, what is this? What is that? What is that? Um, probably the the best book that's been written on this is a um, is called Belief Without Borders: Inside the Minds of the Spiritual but Not Religious by Linda Mercadante. Uh, this book came out in 2014. It's published by Oxford University Press. And one of the reviewers of this book said that um, the author found that the spiritual but not religious description describes people who are both criticized of organized religion, they criticize organized religion, and they also criticize the secular world at the same time. So in other words, these are people who are critical of denominations on the one hand, but are also critical of atheistic evolutionism and agnosticism on the other. So basically you're looking at two types of people, um, both of which are supernatural in the way they approach um, spirituality. You've got the evangelical version of this where I would fall into this category um, where uh, you, you know you, you look to revivalism, Leonard Ravenhill, Great Awakenings from the Past, and um, Azusa Street Revival as generally what you identify with. Um, you identify with revivalism and uh, reformed theology genuinely know, practicing piety within Reformed theology. And then on the other hand, you've got supernatural-minded people who are in the New Age movement. And these are people that are like into paranormal investigation and uh, on the Travel Channel. They believe in ghosts. They see ghosts. They feel ghosts. Everything's a ghost, 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 ghost. Um, that whole, you know, spiritualist tradition, of, you know, mediumship and... Um, that's that's the new age. So both both of these uh, spiritual but not religious people are supernatural uh, in in their worldview. It's just that one of them is Christian and one of them is pagan. And the Christian one uh, leans towards John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards, towards you know Holy Ghost outpourings in the past, William Seymour, um, and understanding you know about their lives, what it was that made those Holy Ghost outpourings happen. And, uh, and then the New Age movement dabbles in evil spirits, essentially, but they don't know any better. So uh, this Mercadante says on, in the prelude to her book, she says, whether this, and she's referring to today's spiritual climate about 10 years ago. So she said, whether this will be the next great awakening, a religious reformation, the launch of the New Age, or our belatedly Belatedly joining Europe in its increasing secularism is not clear. So she, okay, so um, then of course there's always going to be the atheistic and agnostic people, but they have a very small percentage because they don't consider themselves spiritual at all. Um, but so the, the spiritual but not religious people are either A, evangelical revivalism people, or B, New Agers. One thing that the New Agers and the evangelical revivalism people have in common is that they look at denominations and they see them as spiritually dead. These deistic organizations where people are not really seriously engaging in any form of mysticism or any form of supernatural spirituality at all. And so people who are spiritual but not religious um, are, all about, are all about spiritual experiences, basically. Uh, if spiritual experiences are not happening then spiritual but not religious people would not exist. It's all about spiritual experiences. So what is the Bible basis for views like this? Well, 1 Corinthians 2.14, uh, 
A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Romans 7.14, we know that the law is spiritual. So, revivalism is in the spiritual but not religious category. It always grates against the denomination. John Wesley was persecuted by the denomination of the Church of England. Jonathan Edwards was persecuted by the denomination of the Congregationalists. Charles Finney was persecuted by the denomination of the Presbyterians. William J. Seymour was persecuted by the denomination of the Holiness Churches. Uh, so, the spiritual but not religious revivalists will always be persecuted by the religious denominations that they have the most uh, theological agreement with. So, I'd imagine that in my case, if I ever became popular, I would probably get persecuted by Assemblies of God people because they would be the closest to, you know, to my, to my belief system. It's always the ones that are the closest to your belief system that you end up getting persecuted by if you're in this spiritual but not religious revivalist category. Now, if you're in the New Agers, New Agers never get persecuted by anybody, as far as I can understand. Um, they just get told by Christians that they're worshiping the devil. And if that's persecution, I don't know. But, you know, they just stay in their own little, you know, cubby holes, and cults and stuff. They never really engage uh, or confront religious organizations. Uh, but revivalists do. Um, and so, therefore, revivalists get persecuted. New Agers don't. Of course, New Agers or witches have been persecuted in times past by Puritan governors, but when is it, you know, that's not going to happen today. So persecution can be definitely expected when you're, you enter into revivalism. Wesley said that uh, in, his, in his sermon, Scriptural Christianity. Uh, William uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth said that in his book, Ever Increasing Faith, in his chapter on the baptism in the Holy Spirit, how to be full, full of the Holy Spirit. He says the moment you get full of the Holy Spirit, you'll get persecuted for it. Um, so the persecution comes from the organized religion from which you left, or depart, or schismatized from. Persecution comes from the denominations that you're critical of. Persecution comes from the people that you're criticizing, um, of course, because what you're, what the revivalist, the spiritual but not religious revivalist is saying is saying that um, their religion is fake, and um, and and his religion is true, and you need to come over to my religion, and stop following your religion, because your religion is hollow, superficial, and shallow, and this what I found here is genuine. And so then an argument breaks out. Spiritual but not religious essentially is necessary for revivals to break out and supernatural experiences to happen. Jesus was spiritual but not religious. The apostles were spiritual but not religious. The apostle Paul was spiritual but not religious. What was the religious organization? What was the organized religion? What was the denomination that Jesus and the apostles we're fighting against? It was the temple system in Jerusalem. That was that was the religious element. The Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. Okay, That would have been equivalent to an Assemblies of God hierarchy or a Presbyterian church board. Okay, And, and, and so that is the religious part that they are not part of and breaking away from, which was comprised of Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. The organized religion was the temple system and the synagogue system that was spread around by the Pharisees. Jesus was saying, we're not them. We are not that religious crowd, but we're going to follow a spiritual pathway that is different than that. 
We're not going to do what they're doing. We're going to do something different. We're going to be spiritual but not religious. Now, this is not this is not mean to oversimplify matters into saying that just because a person has a church building, that means that they're religious and not spiritual. We're talking about an attitude towards relationship with God in which certain things are allowed and certain things are disallowed. Certain things are accepted and certain things are rejected. And in the spiritual but not religious category, what you will find is that what they will allow for within revivalism from Jesus, the apostles, the Catholic saints, and the reformers and the revivalists, they all have some things in common here. Even though they're widely different people in different time periods, they all have several things in common. These are spiritual but not religious reformers moving in the power of the Holy Spirit and in miracles. What are the things that they have in common? Number one, they definitely are not part of the leading religious system of the day. So that's the first distinction. We are not that. We are not the Pharisees. We're something different. We're separate from that. Number two, there is a sense of raising the bar. A raising of the bar. A raising of the standards of righteousness and of a raising of the standards of mysticism or supernatural spirituality. Okay, A raising of the standards to want to experience miracles. So there's a raising of the standards of morals and there's a raising of the standards for miracles. Learning what that means, trying to learn what that means. Because that's something that the dead religious crowd is not interested in. They are not interested in raising the standards of morality. And they are not interested in raising the standards of the miraculous. They don't even want to have that conversation. It's not that they want to, they don't want to admit that they don't have those things. It's just that they're not even wanting to pursue that. They don't want to figure out how that even works. They don't want to even have that conversation. So the spiritual but not religious people like Jesus, the apostles, the saints, the reformers, revivalists, raise the standard of morals and they raise the standard of mystical experience. That's the number one thing. And that has been expressed many, many ways in many different time periods. The gospel of Jesus Christ always appears as this supernaturally revealed gospel message. Galatians chapter 1. This gospel that I have received was revealed to me. It was not told me by any man. Dream vision. That's where I got it from. This gospel was revealed to me. Galatians chapter 1. So this is a supernaturally imbued message of salvation by repentance, resistance to sin, and faith in the cross. And getting real with God on a private level. On a private level. And uh, and you're not doing it for show anymore, as is often the case with the religious crowd, where it's a show. It's a religious show. And and uh, so this is about private. Often the third element is the private, personal prayer life, becomes a raising of the bar, of the private personal prayer life. The personal prayer life becomes a raising of the bar because there's this understanding that when you have a personal prayer life, supernatural things can happen. What happens when Jesus prays in Gethsemane? Angels come and appear and strengthen him. There's this understanding in the spiritual but not religious crowd is that when you go to pray alone, supernatural things can happen to you. Things can happen. Where in mainstream religious prayer, there's never the expectation that something will happen. It's a ritual. It is dead. It is a dead ritual. So there's this difference between life and death, and the spiritual but not religious orientation, and 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 uh, and that's where the idea of revival comes from. It means to revive, to revivify, viva. It means life. Bring life. Breathe life back into it. Something that was dead before. 
now is made alive again. Um, people say faith without works is dead. Yes, true. If you have a living faith, it will propel you to have good works because there is divine intervention a back of that belief system. There's divine intervention a back of it. In organized religion, you often do not have divine intervention happening. You have what's been called a moralistic therapeutic deism. Billy Graham Baptistic religion is oftentimes described as a moralistic therapeutic deism. It's moralistic. You've got the Bible. You can read some rules. You can try to live by those rules. It's therapeutic because you sing songs and you have community and you feel better about yourself. So it takes on the characteristic of some type of a therapy. And it's deism, which means that there is no divine intervention. There is no supernatural experiences. There's no spiritual experiences. There's no miracles. Absolutely not. And you only view God as this far off distant creator who created the world. And you only, you never, your understanding of God never goes into his attributes or into any experiences of his character or any direct presence or contact with him and his spirit. No. God is a, is a remote idea related to nothing but intelligent design going nothing further than that. That's the religious conception of God. When you're in organized religion, it, he's this far off thing. It's this far off thing that's way up past the heavens that you'll meet someday when you die. There's no communion with God in the religious mentality. It, 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 he's far off, way, way up there, millions of miles away. There's no eminence, there's no presence of God in the religious mentality. In spiritual but not religious, we, we break away from the dead religion because we need his presence. We need his presence. The Desert Fathers, St. Anthony, you study the Desert Fathers. These guys are living in the desert. Why? Because if they had stayed in the city, number one, they would have been died. They would have been killed because of the Romans. But number two, there was something dead religiously dead going on in the city. They had to pull away to have experience of God to sustain them. The monks, these reform movements within the Catholic Church, the reformers, the revivalists, there's always these schisms happening, but for always for a good reason. And always the schisms are always happening for all the right reasons when it's being done by a saint or reformer or revivalist. They're breaking away for all the right reasons. Okay. Because they're trying to get back to the Bible, they're trying to get back to the book of Acts, and they don't care what people say, they want true Christianity. So if it's the Desert Fathers movement, or if it's any of the, uh, you know, the Benedictines, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, uh, the Lutherans, the Discalced Carmelites, Methodists, when they're starting out, when they're starting out, not long after they become staid religious institutions, when they're fresh new movements, the Pentecostal movement, this is where you can really, and you really read the literature, you can really see the activity of the Holy Spirit moving in these people's lives. Because they're, the activity of the Holy Spirit is coming in and it is telling them it, to break away from the dead religious Laodicea lukewarm spirit church organization and, and be safe so that they can experience the Holy Spirit and be saved. Really actually saved with the witness of the Spirit. And that is the ultimate purpose behind the Christian spiritual but not religious category, the revival category, is to get people to really, truly, honestly experience the Holy Spirit and know that they're saved by the Holy Spirit. And problems erupt when this happens because it is spiritual, but it is not religious. And is that not religious part? That conflict with the organization, that conflict with the organized religion, that conflict with the denomination, that's the same spirit and attitude and demon, if you will, because Jesus said that the Pharisees were of their father, the devil, and that they literally had, that they were children of the devil. So that means that there is a religious spirit, a.k.a. an organized religion 
demon, and aka a denomination demon, a demon nation demon. If you're part of a non-denominational church, that's no salvation from the demon of denominationalism, demoninationalism, demonicationalism. But if you're in a non-denominational church, you might just have a better chance of finding the spiritual not but not religious category. Because here there's intellectual freedom, theological freedom, mystical hunger, hunger for the supernatural. There's no guarantee. That's why you have to really know what you're looking for. And you've got to read the Bible first and know what you're looking for and be really hungry for the Lord. But you can't just go to a church, go to an organization and say, done, done, and done. That's not the same. That's not the attitude you find Jesus, the apostles, directing you to. When you really look at Jesus and the apostles in the Bible, they are directing you to be spiritual but not religious. They are directing you to be revivalistic in your personal life and not part of the Pharisees and their temple system and their synagogue system. Not part of the group, not part of the established dead religious traditions, but part of the life-giving, mystically infused, supernaturally charged spiritual movement of the Holy Spirit that's going on right now. It's a total different. It's Holy Spirit experience based and usually in conflict with denominations that don't have Holy Spirit activity in them anymore. Spiritual, but not religious. Holy Spirit experience based, not denominational. You might say, well, why can't we have the best of both worlds? I don't know. I don't know why. But one thing I do know, you can't have them both. You can't. It never works that way. And if you don't believe me, you're just going to have to experience it for yourself. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.